For the framers of the U.S. Constitution, it was crucial for the new national government to have an independent power to raise its own money. For that reason, Article 1, Section 8 expressly announces a power to impose taxes. Here's the language, but let me begin by dispelling a common misconception about this clause. Today it's known as the Taxing Clause or the Taxing and Spending Clause. But just before the semicolon, there's a reference to providing for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Does this mean that Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 contains a broad power to enact any law that promotes the general welfare? Now, it's not a completely outlandish interpretation, but it is one that has been consistently rejected for centuries. To read this clause as if it created a general welfare power would mean that the clause describes three different powers, taxing, paying debts, and making any law that serves the general welfare. This approach has a number of problems. First, why would a sweeping power over general welfare be hidden partway through a sentence that begins and ends with taxes and debts? That seems like an odd location for such an important power. Second, if there was a general welfare power, we wouldn't necessarily need the rest of the list of other enumerated powers. They would just be examples of laws that might serve the general welfare, and why do exactly would we need that list? Third, a freestanding general welfare power would be the equivalent of a federal police power, and that idea has been rejected at least as early as McCulloch v. Maryland. So the accepted reading recognizes that Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 is about taxing and spending. Common defense and general welfare are good reasons for taxing and spending, but the clause has not been interpreted to authorize anything other than taxing and spending. The Kickstarter considers some constitutional questions about taxing that might come before a court. First and foremost, courts won't rule on the decision to impose a tax. If the legislature decides to impose a three-cent tax on hot dogs and a four-cent tax on hamburgers, there's no legal principle allowing judges to overturn those fiscal decisions. Now, a question that can and does sometimes go to court is whether a law is really a tax at all. Please pause the video for a moment and consider these three laws. Which of them are taxes? All three laws are governmental commands requiring people to pay money whether they like it or not. But your instincts are probably telling you that only item A is a tax, item B is a civil law to protect private property rights, and item C is a criminal law that also protects private property rights. But those laws aren't taxes. So this brings us to the definition of a tax. What exactly is a tax, anyway? The first requirement is for the law to raise some revenue for the government. On the previous slide, the civil law requiring a shoplifter to reimburse a store owner doesn't raise any revenue for the government, so it's not going to be a tax. Now the second requirement is trickier, and at some level it deals with the difference between a tax, as that term is used in Article 1, and a fine, as seen in the Eighth Amendment's ban on excessive fines. The terms most often used in the relevant case law contrast taxes with penalties or punishments. If a law forces a person to pay money to the government as some sort of retribution for wrongdoing, the law is a penalty or a punishment and not a tax. It's often pretty easy to tell when a law is a tax and when it is a punishment, but as with most legal concepts, there can be difficult cases in the middle. And the difficulty arises because paying money as a tax and paying money as a penalty have some important things in common. First, most people find that involuntary payment of money is unpleasant, and the entire purpose of a punishment is to be unpleasant. Second, the threat that one might have to pay money will have a deterrent effect whether the payment is considered a tax or a penalty. Given these and other similarities between taxes and penalties, it turns out there's no one single factor that cleanly separates the two, 
Instead, the legal approach involves comparing a law that is being challenged to other laws. We can compare it to ones that we know are taxes, or we can compare it to ones we know are penalties. If, on the whole, the challenged law has a stronger family resemblance to the laws that are taxes, then we can feel comfortable treating it like a tax. After decades of common law development of the topic, we can identify some characteristics that outline the family resemblance among taxes and that among penalties. And we can use our easy examples from the earlier slide to see how these factors play out. Let's call Law A a 3% payment to the government on retail sales. And let's call Law B the $10,000 payment to the government by a person convicted of theft. Law A looks like a tax, in part because the amount that is ultimately due is assessed in proportion to the amount or value of some underlying thing. More sales, in this case, means more payments to the government. Meanwhile, Law B is going to be the same $10,000 regardless of the amount of goods stolen. Now, this factor does not mean that all fixed amounts owed to the government are necessarily penalties. Flat taxes can and do exist. But penalties are often not calibrated to some underlying amount or value of goods in the same way that taxes usually are. Next, the amounts owed under each law tend to resemble what we ordinarily see as taxes and as criminal fines. Once again, this is just one factor among many. A legislature might decide to impose a higher than normal tax and it can still be a tax. Or it could impose a lower than normal penalty and it could still be a penalty. Penalties are typically imposed as a response to wrongdoing. And in our system, most wrongdoing is accompanied by some sort of mens rea or intent element. Here, Law A requires a 3% payment regardless of the mental state of the person who makes the purchase. We aren't passing judgment on the morality of the person who pays that amount. By contrast, Law B will require a $10,000 payment, but only if there is a finding that the person acted with intent to steal or some other bad intent. This is what the Drexel Furniture case meant when it talked about penalties being associated with Sienter. Next, let's assume that Law A is found in the tax code. It's referred to as a sales tax, and it is enforced by the Treasury Department and its team of tax collectors. By contrast, let's assume that Law B is found in the state's criminal code. It is referred to as a fine or a sentence, and the money is collected by the court and not by any Department of Revenue. All of these things help us determine which is a tax and which is a penalty. Finally, we can attempt to judge whether the law's purpose or effect is to coerce people to behave differently. This can be a tricky factor, of course, because taxes can end up making people behave differently than they would in the absence of the tax. But the general idea here is to distinguish between an encouragement to change behavior with coercion to change one's behavior. Here, in light of the overall operation of Law A, it seems unlikely that it's going to stop people from making all purchases. And likely it wasn't intended to have that result. By contrast, Law B seems to exhibit a purpose to force people not to steal and it is likely to have that effect. In light of these factors, it seems pretty easy to conclude that Law A is a tax and Law B is a penalty. Now, does this mean that Law B is unconstitutional? No, it does not. It just means that Law B is not a tax. Congress might still have an enumerated power that would allow it to enact something like Law B, and indeed Congress has done so on many occasions. It's just that these laws are not taxes.